Enfin, je veux dire, c'est un grand plaisir de nous accueillir. Pourquoi Parce que la thématique de l'habitat collaboratif, le fait d'habiter autrement, de s'approprier différemment son logement, au-delà de son logement, bien évidemment, l'espace public, l'espace commun, la ville, est une thématique qui est une thématique qui la donne avec une particulière importance en ville de Genève, de manière générale, dans le canton de Genève. Donc l'idée de travailler sur une autre façon d'habiter, c'est également pour nous, les pouvoirs publics, la volonté d'apporter des réponses qui sont des réponses différentes, innovantes, peut-être plus en résonance avec les problématiques qui sont les problématiques And nearly everywhere, depending on the political and climate, it's either to the market or to the state to provide housing. Market or state. Why are the officials to rely on the citizens to provide houses? The sales are active. Not just the state, not just the market. Probably because It's been being about to trust the community. This is an evidence for me. That's why I got to the Housing Cooperative Federation three key priorities. The first one is the access to the land. It's the first and necessary step. More than 100,000 square meters, so that in Geneva, on 11 different parameters, are now for the cooperatives. It's more than 1,000 accommodations. Two years ago, for most of this, uh, most of this uh, uh, job, it was just 100. So it's 1,000. Political uh, wills works. The second key is the financial support. The committees have to ever to finance their project based on decent and sustainable condition and from long term. It's why the states give guarantees a home loan. So the cooperative can have up to 90 or 95% of the value the, of the value of the home guaranteed uh, by the states. So it's easier to take a credit at the bank because the states lag behind the government. The third key, the last one, it's the technical assistance. Because no one was born an architect or engineer, Geneva has a foundation to provide assistance and advice along the whole process. When I talk about the right to have adequate housing, I urge all of us to go back to basics. To not think about all the technical side of the right to adequate housing or the programmatic or policy-driven sides to housing. I ask us to be very simple, to ask ourselves, what, is, what does this mean in a really basic way? And what it means is not just the right to live with four walls and a roof, but the right to live in peace, with security, and with dignity. I actually think that we, are, we have everything that we need to make the necessary changes. I think we can do it. I think we can revert housing back to human rights globally. We have international human rights treaties that codify the right to adequate housing. We have the new urban agenda, recently negotiated, political commitment. It does affirm the right to adequate housing. It affirms that forced evictions are unacceptable. It affirms that the criminalization of people who are homeless is unacceptable. We have the sustainable development goals, in particular target 11.1, which says that everyone shall be insured adequate housing by 2030. We have, very importantly, local governments. I've spent a fair bit of my mandate working on the relationship between local governments and international human rights. Local governments have such an important role, and we've already heard here, what's happening right here, the important role that local government can play 
and is playing to ensure the right to adequate housing. But I suppose more, most importantly, we have you. People-based movements, cooperatives, coalitions. And you will make the difference as you articulate your claims and demand a better world from your governments. So the challenge now is to convince states to make a shift, to shift away from housing as a commodity and toward housing as a human right with a social function. It's a term that is quite new. Um, it's used in lots of different contexts and, and basically it's about lots of different ways that people can work collaboratively, collectively to develop and secure housing for themselves and for their communities. That you can build a city by state, by uh, public mass urbanisation that has been done in the 60s and 70s uh, very strongly in Europe. But you can also do it with private developer, private contractor, that you can channel lots of funds uh, into uh, speculative development. That has been the, one of the largest practice. But there is a third way, and this is the way that is represented here at this panel from the five continents uh, here at, at this round panel. And um, these solutions are based on people and collective action. They are based on community engagement. And that is probably something that is a bit hard to understand. That is not the state, that is not the private sector, that is a common. And as a common, as a community, uh, these models are building a city by the inhabitants and for the inhabitants. The, the objective tonight is somehow to give you a perspective of the challenge that are faced by each of these models and show you the common points, because there is a lot of points in common. Land is the key, it is the foundation, it is where you start when you want to extract housing from the market. It is where you start when you want a community to organize, and it is the way that you extract this land that will define a lot of other things. And Antonio just, just earlier talked about uh, FPLC, for those of you who have come from Geneva, you will know that this is a foundation that buys something around 20 million of uh, land from the private market to lease it back to the housing cooperative, so to extract somehow the land from the speculative market and enable housing cooperatives. So um, and then I think that you have a very similar uh, initiatives in Latin America and that you built land banks. Can you please tell us a little bit more about this? In Uruguay, we have a two mechanism. First, in national level, we have a land bank that was created in the 90s. The government buy lands, and with the agreement between the government and social organization, Food Bank, that is the Federation of Housing Cooperatives, the government command to reserve the land for the cooperatives. Uh, so when the cooperatives has the money, it's buy the land for a government as a good conditions. And in the second level, we have a municipal government. And in 2007, the Montevideo government created a civic, that is a land bank, in the same way. But is it not enough to, to cover the demand of the housing cooperative? So there is a two mechanism that work well. But the problem is that uh, not enough supplies of land to cover the demand to the housing cooperative. In Central America, we try to implement similar mechanism in El Salvador, in Nicaragua, in Leon. But the, the, the government, they, in the first time, they show a political intention to replicate the similar mechanism. Land is a very big issue when it comes to the grassroots communities. The problem is that we are staying in different settlements. We can't drive our development because we don't own the land. And on the other side, we don't know who owns the land. 
the different stakeholders that are on in this land. We've got municipalities, we've got regional government, we've got national government, we've got private sector. As communities, we will go to all these doors to find out who owns the land. And then we won't get an answer. So development for us becomes difficult because we don't want to spend or create assets on the land that doesn't belong to us. So what we do, hence I'm having this t-shirt that says, Know Your City. It's a campaign that Shake Dwellers International is promoting, whereby we, we have agreed in all the 33 countries that we should use the tool of profiling, enumeration, identification of pieces of land, mapping the land where we are settled and then using this information to engage with municipalities and national government. So we realize that it's very important to organize ourselves as people from informal settlement. Collect information because we know that municipalities, local authorities, and other stakeholders under government auspices, they don't even know where we are because when you go to their offices, you want to check the general plan of the municipality. You'll find that your community is not even existing on the general plan. And then what we do as communities, we say we've got the power to collect our own information. We've got the knowledge on how to collect this information. But we are forging the partnership that is participatory, that is inclusive, that is implementable by using this information. Obviously, the Community Land Trust model focuses on access to land for those who would be barred in order to assure security of tenure and permanent affordability in the locations where people need to live and want to live for work and access to other facilities. The Community Land Trust model is a model of collective ownership of land that allows individual ownership on the land of homes or as we have cooperatives, nonprofit facilities, gardens, what people need in the community. And the way we organize that is the, the community land trust is a membership organization that is, that is not for profit, commit, committed to decommodifying land in perpetuity. And our members elect a board of directors that is always made up of residents of our homes at, at, in equal numbers and the third who are residents of the region not already in our homes, and then local government in the other third. In our community at Land Trust, we have 2,800 different kinds of homes from shelter to home ownership. And across the U.S., there's 120 community and land trusts, many of whom are doing everything the city needs from uh, uh, urban gardening and farming uh, to preservation of space and, and parks. It was an important step for community land trust that our small city committed that it was really a big idea that we would keep our city affordable for all and accessible to all. And so the city uh, municipal and community lunches partnership is a tremendous one where your city or local government can create um, favorable programs and processes. For example, requiring developers to always set aside permanently affordable land. The next big issue uh, is the access to affordable housing finance. Hopefully, here in Switzerland, we have developed some uh, good solution around that, but that is not the case around the world. I mean, access uh, to finance for the housing cooperative, for the local community, I mean, not access to, for individual, but access directly to the community for affordable finance is one of the major issues. So please, Guido, could you please tell us um, the point of housing cooperative around that? Not only working for a cooperative housing international, but also um, working for a housing cooperative in, in Halle, which is in uh, Saxony Anhalt, which was a former GDR. And uh, this cooperative is, uh, has been established in 1910. It's, already more than 100 years ago. And the, the situation uh, at that time was that it was, again, uh, a massive housing shortage uh, due to the, to the uh, huge population in, in the first years of the 19th century. 
and uh, they decided that only a few, few women and men decided to establish a new housing cooperative, and that's exactly the same situation as now. For example, in, in Germany they are named Baugruppen, but you you know uh, better the expression of the community-led housing. And that, that's exactly the same situation. So we, we only had a, a few people with small wages compared to the average wage uh, at that time and with also small savings. But the few people uh, has been able, because housing cooperative always means uh, organized and shared interests and also organized and shared savings. They has been able with the small savings to begin to build the first residential buildings and to, to live in these buildings. And uh, the, the very big advantage uh, was at that situation, and it's, it's still up to today, that uh, when you put your small savings in the housing cooperative, you can, you can uh, succeed with your goal. And uh, the economic risk and also the, the future financial risk will be as an entity, and that's a cooperative, and not the individual saver who has his money in this cooperative. And so I, I think it's a, it's a nearly perfect model also for yeah for our times and especially for community-led housing. Thank you a lot, Guido. So I understand that housing cooperatives are about putting resource in common, resource together, saving together, and that gives the power uh, to develop new projects. Rose, do you have seen that process in Africa? Latin America, Africa, and Asia. <laughs> Savings is a tool to mobilize our communities. We, we use savings to bring people together. And then we use savings as a leverage to attract more funding. So what I'm trying to say is that savings, it, it, it's a tool that raises our voices to be heard. We say to government, we don't come to you to ask for a cigarette and a matches. We just want you to give us a cigarette because we've got a matches. So we meet each other halfway. So that this saving has capacitated us so much that we have created a relationship with many local authorities, with many national government, but a poor partnership. So you can understand the difference between relationship and partnership. They will agree to support us, but when it comes to implementation, oh, zero. So our savings is giving us the power to continue to talk. That's why I'm here with you today. It's because of the savings. If I was not saving, you were not going to recognize my existence. But because I'm saving with my other colleagues, everywhere they want to see SDI coming to say, how did you make these poor, dirty people to come and stand in front of so many people and talk about their change of life? So we have changed our lives, we have changed our mindset, and we want the formal world to also change their mindset to do things differently because our savings is a driving force for our recognition in the formal world. I think we, we have seen a lot of slums in developing countries because there are no money, no finance that actually uh, can reach uh, these poor people. And what Rose mentioned is the way in which poor people start Start, we can include ourselves into the housing process by start a saving, getting together, uh, allow the demand side to be active and work hard, doing our homework, make a survey, uh, trying to understand who owns the land, uh, what, what is the system relating to the land and housing, and how we work to secure the housing. And this happened uh, in a big way now in African uh, cities and Asia. And we support the, the community to get together to do this survey, to start the saving, and to build the city fund. So you need two tiers. One is at the community level, and another is at the city level. So we support the, the, the community to link together at the city level. With the city level, they can start the city-wide survey. 
uh, activate the demand side at the city scale yeah. and to explore what are the possible land, who own the land, how to negotiate and so on. And if necessary, they can start getting the first loan to start the first housing project that they could learn together. And in Asia, you can have about two to three hundred city fund, two to three hundred city wide credit. If you include the Thailand, also must go to 500, 600 already. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, this is the ground work to build this collective social housing. Yeah? And if we could institutionalize, like the case of Thailand, we can convince the government that think of the ground happen like this. Why don't the government allocate uh, some money uh, in order to support the people process for collective housing? And we were able to convince them in 1992, they uh, set up this community housing development fund. Yeah. And this fund today, we give the law to any community who organize themselves into this selling uh, process. Till today, we are able to give loans to more than 900 communities, all collective, all community housing. Yeah. So it is important that this uh, housing project is not just houses. It's a system of people to live together. And they have houses, they have the welfare system, uh, they secure it as a collective ownership, they have the uh, community that help each other, no fence among the, the, the different houses, they have the income generation activity, they take care of the system, they help each other at the city scale. Reinventing a new financial system that is not just a banking or market system, but that is a community-led financial system. And that is completely different from the market orientation or the state orientation. And I think that your example uh, in all Asia show that you can not only build houses, but you can build neighborhoods, community, and infrastructure using this alternative community finance. To build a neighborhood, to build a house, you need technical assistance. Now, some way, as Montevideo said, not everyone is an architect, so you need some kind of technical assistance. You need some professionals. And um, maybe uh, there is this long and painful process that the community always faces when they have somehow a land, uh, but they need to go through the whole process before starting the construction. This can take years. And for that, here, the city of Geneva, the Canton of Geneva, has developed this amazing uh, financial tool that gives some kind of revolving fund for technical assistance before you have the construction. So, Rose, can you just share us a little bit your experience of this process uh, that comes before you start the construction? Oh my god, this is a thorny process. When, when the municipality say it's my land, yes, I will allow you to build a house, but you should build it under my own terms. And then you can imagine, you have to start with the project preparation process. You don't have money to start that. You have to hire an engineer, a professional engineer. Now we have to spend our savings to pay the engineer. And on the other hand, no, as the municipality, we can't allow you to build a house with a plan which is not approved. Who should tell me what kind of a house should I build? Because I'm the one to stay in that house. Why should you approve my house? Because you won't be staying with me in my house. <laughs> but we are forced to follow that process. And then at the end of the law, we have to sign a contract with you so that you should tell us how long is it going to take for you to build this house. Like in South Africa, they are saying they are giving us the subsidies. The, the, the community-led housing, house building by getting the subsidies, but they will tell you you have to submit a business plan. We are not educated, we don't even know how to draft a business plan. 
meaning that we have to go to our NGO to help that. After a business plan, okay, go back, bring the implementation plan. After that, bring the contract so that we can take it to the legal department. The relationship between ourselves and our government is so difficult to us as the poor people who can't read the language. Because the, 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 the technical language of government is blocking us to get what we want. So the technical assistance that we are talking about, if we can get volunteer engineers, volunteer technicians, architects, who can join hands with us to, to shortcut the requirements from all these government processes so that we can scale. Because for now, we can't even scale up building. We do have financial muscle somewhere, somehow, but we can't scale up because of these rigid procedures that we have to follow. I think you made it very clear that there is a strong challenge here. This calls also for uh, um, a redefinition uh, of the role of architects and the role of uh, technical assistants there. And I think precisely that's what you've done some sort in developing this community architect network. Normally, the, the, the design of uh, housing yeah, by the architects in many of the public housing is so old. Okay. Uh, no identity. How can we find a way that the architect planner are supporting the people? People are the subject. They have the relationship, they have the subgroup, they have their way of living, they, uh, they want to review their system of housing, system of their community in a certain manner. Okay. Architect is supposed to help them uh, into a form of change. Architect help in the proper transformation uh, from the, the social system into the form of community in which it suits them group of people. Yeah. So we need to, to change the way how architect or planner or even engineer and others are uh, supposed to do for this kind of community housing. Yeah. And this, this is the reason we have this uh, community architect network. But we make also the community become architect for their own design of their own community. And this is the beauty of this. Yeah? Uh, so if you, we want to do the housing development or collective housing in a big scale, you need a lot more uh, architects or planners to support the people process on the ground. And in this way, now, for instance, in Thailand, we link with many of the universities. In, in our case in Thailand, it comes from the subsidy on a certain part that has been allocated for this technical system, which people can get. Can, can ask the assistance from the different university or for the network or even from the private office. We have an, an institute of assistencia técnica and we have an, uh, a lot of independent groups of professionals in architecture, engineering, social assistance, in even account support and they work at the cost. And this work is included in the finances of the government to the cooperatives. We have a mutual aid, and we understand that the process by which the people build their house, uh, we, we build we, uh, ourselves, themselves, but with a technical assistance. This is the difference between self-construction and mutual aid. And this is a formal way for us to build the houses with a good quality. In Central America too, we demand to include the technical assistance to the founding model in, is the same in Uruguay, but uh, we, we, we have to, to fight to include this, this uh, technical system in, in the finance. And the loan is a combination of public credit and subsidies and include the technical system. So all of our residents, when they pay their rent or their ground fee or their lease fee, contribute to building a capacity, a central capacity in the trust in order to provide very similar kinds of technical support to them. So when a community wants to 
build uh, apartments or co-op. We can take the residents through the process, but hire the the planners and the architects and engineers that will take us through the complex planning process. As you said, it's the same with us. It seems that many of these regulations seem to be added barriers to keep lowering to people out of housing. So we have that capacity to get through the development, but also to assemble the funding and financing, which for us, we have to assemble maybe many, many, many sources just to build. Uh, one small uh, building of homes. So that's one kind of service we can provide collectively in the trust. The second kind is that something that's very important to all of our residents now because of the financial crisis and then following on what's happened to workers uh, in our country in terms of their, their, um, their uh, economic instability, even in the workforce. And so we provide financial education for people trying to buy homes and credit repair and how to access a good mortgage and those kinds of things. And we do the same thing for people wanting to rent so that folks can, on a small budget, manage the security of their home because we want people to have access and also security in the long term. Today, we are having a very, very special thing happening because this is probably one of the first time that you have all the actors working on these community-led housing process in every continent, joining hands and saying, we want to work together. But what's happening here is that all these people are saying, yes, we are solving our problem, but what is happening in Africa, what is happening in Asia, what is happening in Latin America, is basically the same problem. They are having the same challenge. So why not do it together? And that is the whole idea of building a platform. Sometimes people think that the housing crisis is inevitable and that there is only state and market solution. But here you have example of each continent, of each region, that this is an ongoing process of building a different kind of housing, a different kind of city, a city that is built by and for the people. May finance the uh, a more powerful and interesting tools for the different group of people to work, uh, which could be a mix of grants and loans and uh, existing source. In the capitalist system today, what is lacking is the, the invention of how the finance will reach everybody. But we want everybody to be, uh, to be a part of the existing finance system.